Let's drill down on Bill Barr's statements a little further, said this anchor never. But Joyce, let's let's do that because of the extraordinary nature of a rebuke from um, someone who was viewed to have largely done Donald Trump's bidding at his time overseeing the Justice Department. This is what he says about Judge Eileen Cannon's opinion. The opinion was wrong. The government should appeal it. It's deeply flawed in a number of ways. And then he comes back to, as we just played, the fact that they were subpoenaed and never delivered. They don't have to show the content. Specific advice was given in a memo, for example, in order to prevail in this case. It's not going to change the decision. You have been scathing in your judgment of this ruling yesterday. Tell me where things stand in your view today. Nicole, sometimes as a lawyer, as a prosecutor, you get rulings from a judge that make you angry, maybe because the judge has misinterpreted the facts or the law. This ruling initially made me angry, but the more that I've studied it, it just makes me profoundly sad because this is a judge who does everything that she can to avoid clear law, who does everything that she can do to dismember the facts, to end up in a ruling that creates this sort of a special out for Trump. Because President Trump is really the only person to whom a ruling like this could ever apply. I think every criminal defendant who's under investigation would love to be able to file a motion after a search warrant was executed and put a pause on the investigation. But that's not the way our criminal justice system works. And Trump has a perfect remedy if he's ultimately indicted where he can move to suppress evidence if he thinks it was wrongfully taken. You know, where Bill Barr, I think, hits the target here, and those are words I'm not sure I thought that um, I would ever say on this show or, or anywhere else. I feel um, you. <laughs> we've certainly been critical of him, right? I mean, it, it does mean a lot, though. I think that this shows that the disenchantment with this ruling is, is really a legal matter, an appellate lawyer sort of thing, as opposed to a political matter. Um, there are a lot of flaws with this ruling. But chief among them is the fact that she believes that executive privilege claims can be resolved using a special master. That's not how any of it works. And this process will break down and, and ultimately it will just lead to a lot of uh, delay. And DOJ is sort of damned if they do and damned if they don't. Filing an appeal in Atlanta takes a good bit of time. Maybe they can convince the Court of Appeals to expedite, but there's still time involved. You have to do all these technical things like filing the record from the trial court and briefing can't start until that's done. By the same token, if DOJ goes ahead with the special master process in this situation that's really not suited to resolve the claims that Trump is, is going to raise here, it creates a mess. So what the judge has done here, rather than speeding the administration of justice, is to delay it and to interfere with it. And, and I regretfully agree with um, the former attorney general in this matter. Uh, I said this last week, we will all remember where we were when um, Bill Barr made one of the more salient points about um, uh, the special master ploy. And, and it clearly is that. This is, Joyce, what the Justice Department argued in the hearing on Thursday, it, it, it falls in line with the points you're making. This is Jay Bratt said that under the protocols that are proposed by the plaintiff, they would regain access to those, including potentially the former president. We have no idea where they would be stored. And again, this would be giving access to people, things they do not have the right to have access at this point in time, all for what we think is a fanciful view that somehow they would be they would successfully be able to interpose an executive privilege objection that would prohibit the executive branch from reviewing the executive branch materials for core executive branch function. Um, he, he, he argues how nonsensical Trump's argument is, and yet she sides with Trump. How did that happen in your view? Well, look, every judge has to be appointed by a president from one of our political parties or the other, right? It's no one springs onto the federal bench without going through that mechanism. And so I always hesitate to criticize judges because of the party that appointed them. 
But here one struggles to believe that this judge could possibly not be smart enough to appreciate the issue. She's well educated. She spent six or seven years in the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of Miami before she went on the bench, in the Southern District of Florida, before she went on the bench as both a trial lawyer and an appellate lawyer. And so, you know, at some point you just have to be willing to call it what it is, and it's a disingenuous opinion. And the problem here um, that you're identifying is, is really a significant problem. We have documents that were <clears throat> created in the intelligence community, documents that are, are classified top secret. Revelation of those documents without authorization could do grave damage to our national security. And what is this judge going to do? Oversee a process where those are sent back to a former president who's shown he's not trustworthy, who's shown he doesn't care about national security? Why would a federal judge put the country at that level of risk? I think her opinion ultimately raises a lot of questions that we don't yet have answers to. And that may force DOJ to appeal this issue to the 11th Circuit rather than going ahead with the special master process, hoping that it would be quicker. There are some real problems here in resolving the executive privilege issues. Well, it's not like um, last week someone pretending to be who was it, a Rothschild, didn't infiltrate Mar-a-Lago. I, I mean, it, it's not like Mar-a-Lago isn't a flashing yellow soft target for American adversaries. Of course. And, and I got to tell you, um, it feels like to me that the judge had a pile of legal precedent and legal rules on her desk, and she went like this, wiped them all off the desk, and then spitballed, how can we give him a win? Why? I don't know, because the irony is, by ignoring, I mean, let me just give you one example. I could get into the weeds of this opinion, as Joyce could, as many other lawyers that could come on your program and do, but it is all, it's complicated, and you get in the weeds quickly, and people will, like, their eyes will roll back in their head, and they'll switch channels, so I won't do that. But what I will say is just, get, let me give you one example. To enjoin the investigation, the judge has to find that the person asking for this has a high likelihood of prevailing. Well, has Trump prevailed in any court on executive privilege? No, he has not. So the idea that this judge would find that Trump has a high likelihood of prevailing on executive privilege, which she must find in order to do the injunction, it's bonkers. It's just bonkers. So in this opinion, she says she thought the appearance of fairness was very important. I got news for her. She is now the author of a, an opinion that just screams this is not fair, screams this is not based on law, totally untethered from precedent and legal precedent and, and, and the law. And so it is, and she's very early in her career. I don't think she'll ever overcome this opinion in her wow. entire career because it is so bad. I would love to talk to the clerks who work for her because I guarantee you they've had some sleepless nights over the last few nights.